Welcome, everybody. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respect to the traditional custodians of the land where I am in Brisbane, recognizing the country north and south of the Brisbane River as home of both the Turbul and Yagara people and their elders past, present, and emerging. I would like to extend this honor to all of the traditional lands of which of where each of us are zooming from today. It's really good to see all of you again. Good morning. Uh, we're beginning today with a few seated stretches to wake up our bodies with Shane from Unplugged Yoga in Paddington. Um, good morning. I'm Shane from Unplugged Yoga. Um, yes, I met Hillary this week and um, I'm going to be doing the morning stretching to wake up your bodies. Next, I'd like to introduce Jamie from Wayapa Works. Jamie Marley Thomas is a proud Ganai Kurnai man and Mara descendant. And in 2014, Jamie and his partner Sarah founded uh, an organization called Wayapa Works, which is an internationally accredited and trademarked earth mindfulness connection practice. So this practice is based on indigenous uh, wisdom of living in harmony with the environment. And Wayapa combines ancient earth mindfulness with movement meditation storytelling and sustainability to create earth, mind, body, spirit, well-being. Jamie's passionate about helping people tap into their ancestral knowledge to create purpose, belonging, and intergenerational well-being for a healthier, more connected planet. Everyone, please, well, we can't hear you um, clapping, but maybe do some snaps towards the screen to give Jamie a warm welcome. Thank you, Jamie. Um, first, I'd like to say, Nata Manga took Malu Katanganai, Kerry Wurong Chapel on the Dia Mereng, Manganuchung, whatever on Alamine, Manganuchung, whatever on Mereng, Manganuchung, whatever on Mara, Manganuchung Mereng. I just want to honor the ancestors of the land in which I'm uh, presenting today on the, the ancestral lands of the Wadarong people, my great great grandfather, my great great grandfather's people, and um, extend that acknowledgement to the, the traditional and original custodians of the peoples that you're sitting on but also the, the land that sustains you and your families. And also honor each and every one of you, your, your families, your ancestors, and the ancestral lands in which your people came from to be where you are today. Um, thanks for uh, the invitation, Hilary and Marty. I'm gonna start by doing a, I always do a, a energetic healing, a smudging ceremony um, where I've got a little honor bowl here. And it's about connecting into um, our ancient ways. Uh, a lot of business was done and conversations were done around the fire. And it's about honoring all of our, our ancient ways of uh, conversating and sharing narratives. So it's just a small little honor bowl that I wanted to start the, the session with. So as Ilya explained, we created Way Up Work, that means to connect to the earth, uh, to help people reconnect to, to Mother Earth, to have that purpose of looking after Mother Earth. So. Um, we share it from three platforms, acknowledging the environment. We share it from acknowledging our own personal experiences, but we also share it from our own cultural stories and narratives from where we come from and descend from. Um, all of our ancestors at some point in time lived in reverence with nature. Uh, if you think about whether you're from uh, England or whether you're from uh, South Africa, or Africa, sorry, or uh, you know, Americas, all ancient peoples had that understanding and awareness of the seasons and cycles. And when you're tuned into that, when you're tapped into those seasons and cycles, uh, you become more aware of what's sustaining us. So the oxygen that we breathe, you know, the food and the water that we consume. So it's about that interconnectivity of, of us as humans respecting and responding to the, the earth rhythm, rhythms and cycles. Uh, there is a movement practice that's associated with Wayapa. There was a few movements then in that yoga session that are very much like um, some of the movements that we do, the rolling of the shoulders, we do that for the kangaroo, um, the centering, we do that for, for mountains and landscape. But um, we'll just do a narrative meditation today. So, um, so yeah, so it's been a really amazing journey sharing way up. Uh, Sarah went through all the hard work of having it internationally accredited with the International Institute of Complementary Therapists. So it allowed us to get obviously insurance and, and have a modality that's up there that complements other modalities like yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, 
but at the time of certification, it was the first only known uh, Indigenous uh, wellbeing practice from Australia. So I don't know if that's still the same, but that uh, was quite, quite amazing. And we have now, uh, Dr. Marty is one of our WAPA practitioners, but we have practitioners, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people sharing WAPA. And um, we've got over 100 people who have been through, about 120 people who have been through the certification process to become WAPA instructors, or what we call WAPA workers, because you've got to do the work. Um, so WAPA is about that, you know, mind, body, spirit, but the most important thing to have a healthy mind, body, spirit, you have to actually have a healthy earth and a, um, a healthy environment to, to create that mind, healthy mind, body, and spirit. So in WAPA, we say wellness is, is about earth, mind, body, spirit, connectivity for, for wellness. Uh, as Hillary stated, it's not just about our own wellness, it's about the wellness of generations to come after us. So it's about acknowledging and honouring that we, we have to look after this space for generations to come. So if we were to stand here with all of our ancestors behind us, over 200,000 years worth of ancestors, they looked after the environment for hundreds of thousands of years so that the next generation could benefit from that good food, from the clean air, and from that knowledge and understanding that that's what sustains us as human, humans. And um, so it's about the ongoing um, uh, existence of humanity. So what we're gonna to do today is I'm gonna share with you a short narrative meditation. And so I just want you to get comfortable, similar to what you did before, and I want you to close your eyes. Now, you can do this in a few ways with the narrative meditation. You can either go to your special place and connect into the 14 elements there. But what I'm gonna ask you to do today is come on a quick, a quick little journey with me to a place that's very dear to me. It's, it's my birthplace. It's a, a place up on Far East Gippsland of Victoria. And I'm gonna share that with you. So if you can just close your eyes, I'm just gonna take you through the 14 elements of connectivity there. So the first element of Waiapa is the creator. Across the world, all, all indigenous peoples, all peoples have the concept of creator or creation. Where I am born, where I am from, Dalaman was the creator of the landscape. His ancestral children, Borden and Tuck, the Pelican and the Mustak, came to the, to the landscape that he created in the, in the bark canoe. They became the great, 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 great ancestral parents of Organai people, the people in which I descend from. The second element of Waiapa that I want to reverence is the sun. The sun is an amazing planet. It provides the heat, the warmth, the photosynthesis. But when, when, when I want you to connect into that, I want you to visualize sitting by a beach on a big rock and there's miles and miles of just yellow sand and crystal blue waters. Up in the mountains, not far, is the snowy, the snowy mountains. So it's just a vast array of greenness. I want you to imagine the sun rising in the, in the east and rolling across the sky. I want you to connect into that sun, that sun's energy, that vitamin D that makes you well. I want you to connect into the seasons and cycles of the sun. We're coming into the winter solstice, so the sun will be very low in the sky at this point. As it cycles throughout the 365, 364 days of the year, that create that calendar. It's about the solstices and the equinoxes. The third element of Waiapa is the moon. So as you're sitting on that rock looking out over the ocean, I want you to visualize a full moon coming up in the east. Now that full moon cycles all the way through from that new moon to the waxing moon to the full moon where it affects the tides on the planet, but also affects the water in our body. So understanding that being in tune with those moon cycles is a way of keeping yourself aware about your own needs, about when to rest, about when to be energized, about to be aware that the moon is affecting us physiologically and psychologically. The fourth element of the moon is that landscape. So that landscape that's all around us, I want you to smell that salty air, feel that sun. I want you to look out over the ocean and I want you to see a whale moving from east to west as it moves towards the western part of Victoria to have those babies. I want you to look into the landscape, see the animals. What can you see? Is there a wombat, a wallaby, a kangaroo? I want you to look into the sky. One of the totems for my people is the white-breasted sea eagle. I want you to visualize seeing that eagle flying. But that mountains off into the distance, that ocean, that rock, that tree, we are all interconnected. I want you to look into the sky and see a lightning storm coming, a big storm coming in 
from the west as it moves, watch the intensity of the storm. Watch the lightning intensify from the sheet lightning in a cloud lightning. From the cloud to cloud lightning, the chain lightning that crisscrosses over, that chain lightning creates nitrate from the nitrogen in the air to fertilize the plants. And then the bolt lightning, the bolt lightning that hits from the cloud to the ground, that charges the minerals, that lights those fires. For billions of years, Mother Earth has a necessity of having fire regenerate her, her skin. Our ancestors understood that. They not only created fire for themselves, but they actually fire stick farmed. They used that fire to cleanse the landscape, to replenish the grasses for the animals and the parrots. I want you to visualize that, that, that lightning hitting the ground, starting to fire. Now there's gonna be a, a rain come in from the west. See them clouds rolling in now, the lightning's gone, and there's gonna be a gentle rain. Now we're gonna be there in summertime, so it's gonna be a warm rain. And that warm rain is gonna hit your skin. And when the rain hits the rocks, it emits a beautiful, amazing, minerally smell. So visualize the rain coming from the west, but rain comes from all different directions to give us different seasons and different cycles. As the rain clears, it's been cleared by the wind. I want you to tap into the wind element, the element of seven. Tap into that wind blowing those rain clouds away to bring out the sun again. Feel that wind on your skin. Feel it dry all the droplets of rain off your skin. Have gratitude for that, for that rain and that wind. I want you to focus on that wind picking up all the nutrients on the ground after that fire, all those seeds and blowing it across the landscape and depositing those seeds into the ground. That fire and that sun and that wind and that rain have all contributed to the eighth element, which is the tree. I want you to visualize a tree growing out of that, that soil, that nutrient rich soil full of nitrate from the lightning and it's gonna be a banksia tree with a big banksia cone. I want you to visualize it growing from a small seed under the ground, pushing up through the, the soil and reaching as a time lapses from a tiny seed into a huge majestic banksia with all those seed cones on it that require fire for regeneration. I want you to visualize in that tree, the ninth element, a sea eagle's nest. And in that nest, there's eggs. And one of those eggs, I want you to visualize it opening. I want you to become that sea eagle as you fly up high into the sky. As you fly high up and look down over your landscape, you can see the vastness of the ocean to your left, the vastness of the forests and, and mountains to the right. And I want you to fly along that sand that joins the, the mountains and the ocean. I want you to fly out into the ocean and see a pot of dolphins as a sea eagle. I want you to fly back across into the mountains and see all the animals. Then I want you to come down and land onto the ground where the next element of Wayapa is the land element. I want you to become a kangaroo, hopping. Now, if you want to know about true well-being, watch an animal. They know when to rest. They know when to work for their food. They know how to take care of their family. I want you to be hopping across the landscape and stopping, having a scratch to your left, having a scratch to your right. I want you to reach down, hop along, and then reach down and take a drink out of a creek. As you're taking a drink out of a creek, we're gonna go into the 11th element, which is the eel, or the water element. So it could be a fish, it could be a whale, it's about honoring all things in the water. In this case, up in my country, the short finned eel travels from the fresh water out into the oceans, up to the east coast of Australia to have their babies. Similar to other animals, they migrate, have their babies and pass. Those baby animals with that cellular memory with, that is embedded into their skin, into themselves, know exactly where to go. So they swim all the way back down the oceans and back up those ancestral dreaming paths of where their parents came from. The next element I want you to connect to is the element of the hunter, the masculine. So my ancestors for thousands of years hunted that landscape. They hunted the, the ducks in the air, they hunted the animals on the ground, and they hunted the, the food in the water. So honoring the, the fresh water, the land, and the air that my ancestors hunted. The 13th element of Wayapa is honoring the gatherer, honoring the role and the balance of masculine and feminine it takes to create a healthy environment. In that ancient way, the gatherer would go out and collect the yams and the murnong, so visualizing them digging up and tilling the soil bringing that food back, 
So the knowledge, the ancestral knowledge of the seasons and cycles of our ancestors was so important for survival, but also important to thrive. The final element of Wayapa is the element of the child. And Wayapa is built in the beginning from the creator through the 14th element of the child who becomes the creator. It creates the environment for the next generation. So we, as the children of the land, are the creators of what's to come in the future. The masculine and the feminine, the hunter and the gatherer, has to teach that knowledge to those children about earth connection, about responsibility, and about purpose of taking care of the environment. So not only the knowledge of the seasons and the cycles are passed on to the children, but the stories that go with that. But at some point, that child has to be put down. So as the gatherer picks up the child, nurtures, passes to the gatherer, gets nurtured, at some point it grows up when they get too big, they put the child down. We teach the children to walk, we teach the children to talk, we teach the children to swim. So the analogy of looking into your reflection in the water, to learning to swim, all that knowledge that you've been told, bring that water on your face. I want you to visualize seeing a young Aboriginal child in the, in the beach as he takes his first step into the water, toes, ankles, waist, and then visualize that child then pushing out to take their first strokes. And the, the adulation that that child feels because he's grown up seeing his family members hunting abalone, hunting crayfish, spear fishing out there in the ocean, that feeling of purpose that they can do that now and provide for their family and be a part of that village system. And then visualize that child coming back and then celebrating with his cousins and his brothers and sisters and with the rest of the community by slapping his arms through the water and reaching down and picking up big handfuls of water and throwing it into the air. Watching the droplets in the sun. So the interconnectivity of the 14 elements are all about benefiting and nurturing those children for generations to come. So if you can now open your eyes. Thank you for um, inviting me to share that very short narrative. Um, and um, I know Sarah's going to be sharing um, a code that you can connect into if you wish to do the, the online course or learn more about WAP at a later date. But thank you again, Hilary and Dr. Marty, for inviting me here to share that quick little story about WAP. Thank you, Jamie. That was beautiful. It made me smile at the end to imagine the, throwing the water up in the air. Dr. Wadi Mason is an environmental scientist. She's an author and a land healer. Her background, is in corporate, uh, her background in corporate environmental management and energetic healing has afforded her an in-depth understanding of practical and metaphysical approaches to helping Mother Earth. In 2018, she released an award-winning book called Earth Healing, Healing, to, Healing the Earth to Heal Ourselves. And also drawing international acclaim in the book were the illustrations created by Kathy Gardner. And Kathy is a self-taught artist and illustrator. Um, she draws inspiration from the female form, from nature, botanicals, from fashion, and the yesteryear. Um, Kathy, <clears throat> excuse me, predominantly favors the incorporation of simple form and line work into her, into her design. A shift from a corporate career following a terminal cancer diagnosis and now on a path of healing has seen Kathy return to her creative roots. And she also uh, has a wellness advocacy um, behind her alias, The Naked Gardener. So let's give our warm online welcome through the, through the virtual snap to uh, Dr. Mari Mason. Hi everyone. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about some creative ways to connect with nature. Um, I, well, my passion is really about getting people to, um, to take action and care about the environment. I consider myself a voice for the environment and I'm really passionate about turning around the damage that we've done. Um, I have a lot of experience in environmental management and uh, I've learned that there's an effective way of getting people to take action and an ineffective way. The ineffective way is telling people how bad things are, telling them that they have to change, telling them that they need to do better and you know what a terrible job we're all doing, even though that's actually true. But to get people to take action, I've found that an effective way is to get people to experience and appreciate nature for themselves. So, you know, seeing a, a mother bird in nature 
feed a little baby bird and that feeling that you get of, oh my God, like nature is incredible or seeing a whale breach up close, that feeling of just, you know, the, being in awe, the biophilia of seeing nature. When people feel that for themselves, they naturally want to protect it. So there's no need to preach about how we need to do things better. So that's really the aim of my work these days. Um, I recommend spending 20 minutes in nature a day. Uh, I know that that is a lot for people, but I like to really teach some really practical ways that you can fit into your daily routines so that you don't have to think, oh, there's no way I don't have time for that. Um, just 10 minutes a day actually has been scientifically shown time and time again to reduce stress, pain and anxiety. So even if you don't really care about nature that much or you're not really that interested in protecting the environment, just spending time in there will help you. So 10 minutes a day, will um, you'll feel it, you'll understand that, yeah, this is actually beneficial for me. 20 minutes a day, I promise you, will transform your life. So I recommend 20 minutes a day. And when I'm talking about spending time in nature, I'm talking about physical connection. So your bare feet on the earth, sitting on the earth, laying on the earth, gardening, touching plants, um, touching the soil, that physical connection, that's where you get the real benefits of that. Um, so some really simple ways to start including some nature time in your daily routine. Um, you can just start your day by having your coffee or your tea or your breakfast out in the yard now. So, you know, shoes off, just standing in the yard, just watching what's happening, what birds are going past today. Is the moon still out? How does it look? Um, of course, through all of this, why up it is a great way to connect with nature. So um, I'll just say that <laughs> right from the beginning, but these are some other ideas. Um, you can start doing your exercise routine. So, um, you know, you can do some running on the grass, you can do some skipping, you can do some sit-ups, push-ups, squats, whatever it is, just start doing it on the earth. And I know that some people will start to think, um, you know, I don't want to walk barefoot on the earth. I'd rather wear shoes and my feet will get hurt. Uh, we've got to remember that our feet are so well equipped. They've got thousands and thousands of years of evolution to keep, you know, the nasties out of our feet, to keep the pathogens out of us. Um, that you don't have to worry. It's quite natural. It's the way we're designed to walk barefoot on the earth. Um, and if you've got quite soft feet, it only takes about two weeks for your feet to really harden up if you're doing, if you're walking every day. Um, if you have a dog, start walking just some of that, um, start walking your dog with just some of it with your feet, uh, with your shoes off. Um, doesn't have to be the whole walk, just 20 minutes of it. Um, if you have kids, you can start playing with your kids in the backyard with your shoes off now. Um, start sitting on the earth while you're watching them. If you're playing with them in the park, start getting everyone's shoes off. While they're climbing trees, start getting their shoes off so they're having that physical connection. Um, if you have kids sport to go to on the weekend, start sitting on the grass fields instead of sitting in chairs with your shoes on. Um, if you're someone who has to do a lot of work, I know it's quite easy at the moment in ISO, we can start taking just a few phone calls outside with our feet, um, with our shoes off outside or sitting on the earth. Um, you can just, if you have a laptop, you can start doing, just checking your emails at a local park or in your backyard. Um, if you are someone who's in the city who um, has to spend a lot of time in the office, a great way to get your nature time is to um, go to the botanical gardens at lunchtime instead of sitting in a busy food court that's just gonna you know, do your head in because it's so noisy and um, so many senses going at once. Um, you can, um, you know, at nighttime you can still use nature. You can stargaze for 20 minutes, just stand outside and look at the stars. Um, you could also have a fire in your backyard and sit around it. Um, there's so many things that we can do that, to get that nature time that we can just fit into our daily routines already. It doesn't have to be this big thing where we have to go hiking somewhere and go for a long drive or we live too far away from the beach so we can't do it. Of course, I encourage doing those things too, but there's so, so many easy ways to include it in our daily routines. Um, of course, gardening is another great one. Um, even if you just do it on weekends, just make it routine to do, do your weeding on weekends. Um, so there's some really simple ways to just get your nature time every single day. The other thing I wanted to talk about, um, another creative way to connect with nature, is to start being part of nature. And what I mean by that is start realising that we are very much of, uh, part of the ecosystems that we, um, that we live in. And um, I really want people to start to become active players in the ecosystem. So we already are active players. Every single thing that we do, 
uh, has an impact on the environment. Although usually at the moment, it's just negative impacts. So polluting our waterways or um, damaging the environment for all the materials we use in our daily lives. Um, so whether we realize or not, we are already having an impact. What I'm trying to get people to understand is that it's so easy to have a positive impact, a conscious impact, and we can do that from our own homes. So some simple ways of doing that, for example, are um, creating a habitat friendly backyard. So, um, you know, you can have lots of different types of places for the little creatures to live in. So you can have some leaf litter somewhere, a water area somewhere, um, as many different tree and plant species as you can to appeal to as many different species. Um, you can um, start having habitat boxes in your backyard. They're so easy to install, they're cheap, or you can create them yourselves. Put up a bee hotel, um, leave water out for birds. Um, have a fence that wildlife can actually traverse instead of having, um, you know, instead of having them come into our yards and getting eaten by dogs because they can't climb up the fences. Um, you can start um, composting. So instead of your food waste going to landfill, start using that, that food and um, using the nutrients and to give back to the earth, to feed the plants um, and whatever other creatures can benefit from it. Um, plant native species, uh, because that is what is the natural food of, of all the um, native animals that live in the area. So that'll invite them back. Um, invite plant species that encourage bugs. And I know that a lot of people probably don't like this idea, but you've got to understand that bugs are actually the basic food source or the foundation for so many bigger creatures. So that'll, that'll attract more birds to your house um, and other creatures as well. Um, you can gift a space of your own yard back to nature. So, um, you know, like just even if it's a meter by meter somewhere, just instead of using chemicals there now, just allow it to do whatever it wants to do. Let whatever wants to live there, live there and just watch it flourish. Um, and of course there's things you can do. I'm talking about backyards. So that's, you know, generally for people who, um, who have a bit of space in the backyard. If you live in a unit or something, you know, you could adopt a little area at a local park or a local wildlife area, uh, local nature reserve, uh, where you support it a little bit, um, and where you can do some of those things for that little area. Um, or of course you can do some, some gardening or just have lots of plants in your own place. You can still compost and put it in a, um, have a little, you know, worm farm on your back deck. Um, and you can still put those nutrients into the earth somewhere near where you live. So it's not just for people who have yards. Um, and once you start supporting nature like this, once you start to be this active player, you just need to sit back and watch it flourish and fall in love. Fall in love with the creatures that come to your place. Fall in love with how incredible nature is and empower yourself, feel empowered that you've created this and how easy it was how easy everybody could be doing this stuff and what a different world we would have if we all supported our local wildlife and supported our local ecosystems. So that is some uh, creative ways to connect with nature. Um, I'm just about to pass over to Kathy now. Kathy illustrated my book, Earth Healing. And I just wanted to go through the process quickly of why I selected Kath because um, this is a creative group, so people might be interested in that. Um, I met Kath through a business group that we did. It was sort of a heart-centered um, business group, um, business course. And we were meeting up every week and talking about our dreams and our ideas. And um, I got to know that Kathy already had an eco background. She was very interested in helping the environment. And she was also living, you know, an eco-friendly lifestyle. Um, so I also learned very quickly that Kath just has this incredible energy. She is just the most divine human being. And um, I wanted someone who would bring a really beautiful energy to my project because it was my heart and soul, still is. And I wanted someone who would support that and, and not just, you know, add to the product. I wanted someone to put their love into it that was going to make it next level, who would, um, other people would be able to feel that when they look at the book, that the love has come from two different people. Um, and so Kath really did that. The other thing is that um, we, we knew that we would work well together. We're both honest people. We're both kind and respectful people. So we, I knew that we would be able to have a great working relationship, which we did, no problems at all. Um, she absolutely understood all the concepts. So I knew that the illustrations that she did would help some people to understand what, what, um, what I was trying to say, but in case I wasn't really explaining myself very well. So her illustrations sort of 
put more understanding for people in there. Um, and the other thing was, of course, she could actually illustrate. And um, I think maybe we'll send out some of Kath's illustrations with the email that follows up um, this presentation today so you can see how incredible her work is. Um, yeah, so that's about it from me. So I will hand over to Kath now. Oh, thanks so much, Marty. That's, you know, I think you almost brought a tear to my eye there. It was, um, you're so beautiful. And, and it's so funny how you talk about connecting, um, you know, with the earth by running around with, um, you know, no shoes on and, and stuff like that. I, I think one of the huge complaints I get from my acupuncturist every time I go and see her is how much I've got grubby feet. So I'm just saying that I'm pretty grounded and connected to earth at the moment. So um, I just wanted to quickly um, jump in and just talk about what, um, how nature inspires my work. And I think it's really quite a simple concept, really. It's, um, it's, it's basically bringing more joy into my life. Um, when I was younger, I grew up on property. I had horses and, you know, your livestock with chickens and going and collecting eggs and things like that, um, growing veggies and, and whatnot. So it really um, instilled that respect and that love of um, nature and the bush. Um, I also was um, always keen in knowing what bird species were in our backyard. So um, it also um, made me always want to go and buy reference books and things like that. I think when my, I first got my first um, pocket money, the first thing that I did was go out and buy a book on um, nature photography. So photography has been a huge um, component of my work. Um, I studied photography when I was at school through TAFE um, and I took that with me when I traveled overseas going through to um, Europe and Africa and spending time in nature reserves and watching um, you know the the African um, animals that we so um, love and adore. But not only that um, I think what inspires me most is those, those bits of memories and, and how um, nature makes me feel when I'm in it, the, the moods that it conveys. Um, I feel calm and connected and I feel like it's a safe space for me. Um, and in that space, it always makes me feel happy um, that I'm feeling that um, connection with the earth. Um, for me, as um, Hilary mentioned before, I've actually had quite a, um, hectic life um, with cancer. So since I was 25, I was um, first diagnosed with cancer. So I've actually spent the last 14, 15 years in and out of um, the hospital environment. And for anyone who's had that experience themselves, you know, you're constantly poked and you're prodded and, you know, operated and scanned and injected. And it's, walking from like one sterile room to another, you feel really disconnected from the environment around you because you're walking around in such a, a fog and a haze um, most of the time. So for me, for my healing journey, it was really important that I had spent um, time out in nature, whether I was taking my dog for a walk or just going and, and sitting and being still in nature. Because when I found that I was outside, I could breathe again. Um, and as Marty mentioned, that's um, the, the journey with my healing has been about having a mindful and an eco approach to my life um, and how I can be a contributor in, in making um, this world a better place to live in. So that's basically the background behind what inspires me. I, I also see um, nature, Mother Earth as, you know, the great news to my work and, and for many of the artists who are in our group today, um, I think for most of you, you know, nature also teaches you how to um, respect and, and respect the subject, re respect the scene that you're, um, you're illustrating or, or um, using in your work. Uh, it's the materials that we use, um, how we choose to use colour, and the textures um, in the environment, but also understanding shapes and lines and patterns. Um, I think 
you know, for me, when you've had that element of illness and trauma in your life, you just want to be surrounded by beautiful things. You want to feel uplifted and you want, you know, things to brighten your day. So I, um, it, it takes me back to a quote and I'll just read this one to you um, from Thich Nhat Hanh. I can't, I'm not sure if I pronounce that um, correctly, but um it says, keeping your body healthy is an expression of gratitude to the whole cosmos, the trees, the clouds and everything. And I think that's really the important element for me in my artwork is having that interconnectivity with, you know, everything around me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how um, I was working with Marty on Earth Healing and, you know, Jamie's been and Sarah have been so wonderful in the background showing the book and the illustrations. So thank you guys. Um, if it wasn't for Marty, I don't know, I, I probably wouldn't have taken this little bit of a leap into this creative space um, that, you know, I've embarked on. She was an absolute dream to work with. Uh, she gave me so much artistic freedom. Um, very clear with her brief um, and as she mentioned our visions really aligned because we have such shared similar values so for anybody who's read Marty's book um, you'll know that um, when you read it, it it's like having a conversation with Marty because her her voice is so strong and so true um, and it, it's it's just so beautiful it's 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 a sharing of like her personal interactions with nature that's been so beautiful and for me to represent that into the drawings you'll notice um, if you read the book that when you have a look at the theme um, illustrations there's elements in there of these personal interactions or symbology that Marty references in each chapter that I refer to into the illustrations so for me, I wanted to make those illustrations impactful enough to stand alone. And I think that we were able to achieve that. But importantly, when I was creating these drawings, I also wanted to be in that mindset with Marty. And most of the drawings I actually did, I took outside. I was listening to meditations, particularly meditation that Marty has on her website. So it got me into the headspace of um, creating what she wanted for her book. Um, I'll wrap it up with um, just some elements of how I think, um, you know, we can bring nature into your work. And I think that's probably a good point. Um, if you want to share yourself um, in the chat of how you think you also like to bring nature into your work. Um, these could be setting yourself a challenge, um, creating a drawing or a craft circle, um, exploring eco solutions to the materials that you use and participating in things like community events and projects, um, learning about the land and the local habitats around you and aligning yourself with brands and clients who share the same vision as you um, and values to strive for change. So Lastly, I think just get out there and um, do your work in the environment and, and enjoy it and explore. Thanks, guys. With the internet and our phones attached to us all the time and how connected we seem to feel to each other through that technology, um, how do you think we, what do you think the effect on that is with our true connection with ourselves to nature? Do you think that um, and how can we combat that, I guess? You go first, Marty. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I think, um, yes, everybody's so addicted to their phones and we just rely on them. And as a society, there's no real escaping them. Um, you've just got to be conscious to, um, to put them down um, and just, you know, look outside of them instead of, what's in front of you in, in electronic stuff because the stuff that's out there is is the really fulfilling stuff and also um you know taking that time away from them is um is what's going to make you a happier person and then want to connect with other people more as well so i think that they're here there's no point fighting them i think we just got to be conscious of how much we uh spend time with them and then also just make that conscious effort or, or understand how necessary the nature time is and I, I concur with that. Totally reiterate everything that you said, Marty. You know, one of the things that I found amazing was that the inventor of the iPod products, the iPhones, 
Um, he wouldn't allow his children to have any technology in the house. His house was out in the beautiful Californian red, uh, what are they call it? The redwoods. Um, yeah, it's quite uh, to the irony of that. <laughs> he wants the rest of the world to be distracted and not to be connected, but his own children, no, no technology. So I think what Marty says, it's a tool that we need to understand. It's a tool that we have to, um, to better ourselves for knowledge, you know, spend less time watching cat videos and more time watching wiper videos or, you know, or, or Googling, you know, where, where's some good earth friendly products, you know, who's good for the environment, use it as a tool to better our connection. But yeah, definitely having those times where you, you just leave it and don't touch it and then just get out and connect. And the more you do that, the more that you'll want to do that as well. For this time, it's either for Jamie and for Kathy, um, both of you in your life stories have experienced um, trauma and both of you have turned to nature through that trauma. And my question is, was that a, a very natural um, instinctive choice um, or was it something that it took you a minute to come around to that this is where you needed to go to help you heal? Okay, Kathy, you can go first. <laughs> Uh, for me, it was a natural, um, instinctual um, thing to, to spend time in nature. But I also think, you know, as I mentioned before, you've got so much going on in your mind and there's so much um, questions and, and things that you ask of the world. And, and one of the beautiful things with um, being out in nature is um, she just listens and she's not judging and she's, she's there just to make you feel like you're... Um, you're embraced by her, you know, the greater things. You're a small element in, in the whole scheme of things, but you always feel like nurtured in her, her embrace. So yeah, that's a, a big thing for me. Nature has always been a healing thing, not only from that, but also um, when you look at it from a, a medical point of view, much of our medicine comes from nature. So um, yeah, it's the interconnectivity. It all, comes full circle. Jamie? Um, I, I was, yeah, I had a very traumatic um, childhood where I had, there was a lot of family violence and, and um, nature was my refuge. And I think what Kathy said was so true. When I needed to escape, I would literally run out the door and run out the backyard. And I was lucky to live way up in Forest Gippsland where there's beautiful rainforests and rivers. And I would just immerse myself in the environment. And that environment helped me and it, and it soothed me. And, you know, that connectivity I had to that country, um, it was, it would literally just embrace me and sit there watching the lyrebirds dancing and singing and watching the wombats, you know, walk through the bush and the wallabies taking a drink or the fish in the river. Like that was, you know, it just took everything away. I used to have long, long flowing brown hair. I thought I was Mowgli out of the jungle book for a couple of hours of the day. And um, yeah, it was, it was, was my place of solitude. And, and even as an adult, I forget that there's so much healing out in that space. And like Marty said, whether you create a space in your backyard, whether it's just sit by your plants in your house, you know, we got more plants than Bunnings in our house. Um, but it's, it's about, you know, making sure that you do spend that time out in, in, in nature in some way. We've had another question come through from my friend Ting. Um, she says, she wants to ask, uh, and she didn't specify to who, so anyone who has the answer here. Um, for those of us who are living in populated areas uh, or countries, and the air might be quite polluted already, what would be your suggestion um, to grounding, to earthing, to be with nature in, in such a um, populated or polluted space? I think, um, I think that you know, um, you know, if you're indoors, like Jamie just said, you know, having indoor plants is fine, but Generally, if you're in a place that is highly polluted, the best place you can go is to nature, like a nature reserve, even if the air is polluted, but it's going to be much less polluted in the nature, nature reserves or natural areas because nature does such a great job at filtering out pollutants. So, um, so I think, you know, if you're going to be there and you have to go out in that air, go as, into it, nature as much as you can for those locations. A couple of things I wanted to say to our community um, today. Um, obviously, since the last time that we met, uh, a lot of important things are happening in the world, um, specifically with the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, I've been doing a lot of personal reflection for myself and in my own life, as well as uh, on behalf of Creative Morning. Um, 
I, a few other things have happened in the last couple of weeks. I've heard from some of you through our social media channels that some of you have reached out to me directly, which has been wonderful. Um, thank you. And um, I've also heard from Tentea again. Um, Tentea was our speaker last month. And uh, the general feeling that all of us are feeling is that we as a chapter can do better. We can do better to use our platform to um, promote diversity, to get all voices up and um, speaking. And so I just wanted to say that we agree and that's true and we should do better and we can do better and we will be doing better. Um, I have I read what Creative Mornings headquarters has to, uh, to say. They, they put a letter out um, to all of our community around the world. And I think they said it really well and they, they said it, uh, they said, we realize that saying everyone is welcome in our manifesto is not the same as intentionally designing an inclusive space that's welcoming for all people. Um, so, you know, this has really made me reflect on other areas as well that our chapter can be more inclusive for all of us. So I believe that if we want different results, um, or some new results we should approach in a new way, which is what we'll be doing. Um, yesterday I met with some of our volunteers and we decided that next week, I think next week, we haven't set a date yet. Um, sometime next week, I think end of week, we'll have a community hour for our chapter. So I invite all of you and I really encourage all of you that can come to come. And this will be a place where we can talk and listen and hear from you and really all shape our future of Creative Morning Prisons together um, and, and continue to be living towards our principle of what Creative Morning stands for, which is everyone is welcome. And uh, I guess that's it for me. Um, have a beautiful day, everybody. Thank you for coming. And I look forward to continuing to be in community with all of you.